We decided that Rupert would uh, kick off this morning, and uh, so he shall. So, Terence, I want to start by explaining what I think the problem is that we're discussing, because I think if we try and summarize it and get it clearer, it should be easier to see how we're trying to bring together the idea of creation and imagination. So let me explain to everybody what I think the problem is as well. Um, there's a crisis in science at the moment, a profound crisis which is going to change science as we know it. And the reason why the crisis is so profound is that two of the most fundamental models of reality that the West has ever known these two fundamental models are both within science and they're now in tremendous conflict. They've come into head-on collision. And this means that uh, shock waves are going through the wor world of science. The existing worldview of science is an unstable combination of two uh, great plates of theory, like continental plates crashing into each other. And where they meet, there are going to be major theoretical earthquakes and disruptions and volcanoes of speculation. The two models are um, concerned with the very basic nature of reality. One of these says that the basic nature of reality is permanent, that there's an unchanging permanence underlying everything that we know, see, experience, feel, and so on. And in classical mechanistic physics, Newtonian physics, that permanence is seen as twofold. First of all, there's the permanence of the laws of nature, the eternal mathematical laws of nature, considered by Newton and Descartes to be ideas in the mind of God, God being a mathematician. This is a very popular and recurrently uh, popular idea among mathematicians, the idea that God is a mathematician. And it, it uh, was a view that strongly appealed to them, and their image of God was as a kind of a Christian God, but with a kind of Platonic or Pythagorean mind, containing essentially the mathematical laws of nature. So that was one source of permanence, permanent mathematical laws. The other source of permanence were the permanent atoms of which matter was supposed to be composed. All material objects were supposed to be made of atoms which were permanent. And these atoms were in mo movement. They combined and permutated and our own bodies and everything we see around us would be permutations and movements of those atoms. Those were permanent too. And the movement that they were taking part in was also permanent, a constant amount of motion. And these permanences were summed up in the principles of conservation of matter and energy. The total amount of matter is always the same. total amount of energy is always the same. Nothing really changes in the realm of matter and energy at the most fundamental level. Nor do the laws of nature change. Well, that's the permanent view of nature, which has been the basis of physics and of chemistry. And to a large extent, it is, still is the basis of physical and chemical thinking. The other view is the evolutionary view, which comes to us from the Judeo-Christian part of our cultural heritage. And in that view, the, uh, the original part in the Bible is, there's one thing that does change in time, in history, and that's humanity. According to the biblical account, human beings are undergoing a kind of evolutionary process from Adam through the patriarchs, uh, well, first Noah, then the patriarchs, then the history of the people of Israel, then the movement from Egypt through the wilderness to the promised land, then the subsequent history of the prophets and the kings, then the coming of the Messiah. This was a process in history which showed a kind of progressive unfolding development, but it was confined to the human spiritual realm. In the 17th century, um, this idea was secularized in the notion of progress through science and technology. By the end of the 18th century, the idea of human progress was a dominant idea in Europe. By the 19th century, human progressive evolution or development was now seen as part of a progressive evolution of all life through the theory of biological evolution. And Right up in this century, only in 1966, did physicists finally abandon their eternal or static cosmology and come to an evolutionary conception of the universe. So with the Big Bang, the whole universe is now seen to be evolutionary. 
This is a very recent revolution in science, and it totally changes our worldview because the most fundamental thing in science is its cosmology, its basic model of the cosmos. And our cosmology has changed now from the static, permanent, or cyclical view of the universe to one which is evolutionary. Now, if nature is evolutionary, if all of nature is evolving, what about the eternal laws of nature? which scientists have taken for granted for so many centuries, concepts going right back to Pythagoras and the ancient Greeks. Were all the laws of nature there before the Big Bang? Well, if they were there before the Big Bang, where could they possibly be? There was nowhere to be, there was no universe. So if the laws of nature were all there before the Big Bang, then they must be idea, non-physical idea-like entities dwelling in some kind of permanent mathematical mind, uh, be that thought of as the mind of God or just the mind of a kind of uh, disembodied mathematician. Um, they, they were thought to be permanent and all there before the universe. This assumption is still held by most of our modern cosmologists. It's something that physicists have not yet begun to question seriously. But as you can see, it's like an idea that's had the, the carpet taken from under it. It's sort of hanging over an abyss um, because there's no real reason why we should assume the laws of nature are permanent in an evolving universe. If the universe is evolving, then the laws of nature could be evolving as well. And in fact, the very idea of the laws of nature may not be appropriate. It may be better to think of the habits of nature evolving. The Big Bang is like the cracking of the cosmic egg. That's its mythological co correlate, the notion of the ancient mythological idea of the cosmos beginning through the hatching or the cracking of an egg, followed by the growth of the organism that comes out. It's an embryological metaphor. Um, and we now have a, a kind of developmental model of the whole universe. It's like a developing organism. It's not like a machine at all anymore. The universe is a growing, developing organism which is differentiating within itself, forming new forms and patterns, an evolutionary process that on Earth has given rise to all the forms of animal and plant life, all the different kinds of microbes, to ourselves and to the many and varied forms of human culture. So the question arises, um, how does this uh, process happen? Um, I myself have been working on a theory which I've put forward in my two books, A New Science of Life and uh, The Presence of the Past, uh, which tries to understand these habits um, and how the habits of nature can evolve. What I'm suggesting is that there's a kind of memory inherent in each kind of thing through in it what I call its morphic field. And that this, as time goes on, each kind of thing has a kind of collective memory of everything that's happened to or previous similar things. So, for example, when a crystal crystallizes, the form its crystal take depends, takes depends on the way similar crystals have formed in the past. Things are as they are because they were as they were, to use Terence's felicitous summary of this um, theory. Um, in the realm of animal behavior, the theory says that if animals like rats learn a new trick in one place, then just because they've learned it, rats of the same breed should be able to learn the same thing more quickly everywhere else. So you train rats to do something in San Francisco and all over the world, rats of that breed should subsequently be able to do it more easily through a kind of invisible influence, like a collective mind of the rats that's changing or developing. There's already evidence that these effects actually occur. And this evidence is summarized in my books. Um, it leads to the idea also that in human learning, um, we all benefit from what other people have learned before. There's a kind of collective human memory, an idea very like Jung's idea of the collective unconscious. So habits build up, and what I'm suggesting is that the regularities of nature are habitual. They develop as habits. Nature goes along habitually. Um, New, thing, new patterns come into being, but through repetition they become habitual. The universe is an evolving system of habits. But obviously, this is only part of the story. If the universe is an evolving system of habits, how do new things ever come into being in the first place? What is the basis of creativity? 
evolution must involve an interplay on this view between habit and creativity, just as our own lives involve an interplay between habit and creativity. So, habit, a theory of evolutionary habits, demands a theory of evolutionary creativity. And what, how can we understand the creativity that's given rise to new ideas, to Beethoven's symphonies, to uh, theories in science, to new works of art, to new forms of culture, to instincts in birds and animals, um, to the forms of flowers and plants and leaves, to the many kinds of rocks and crystals, and to all the forms of galactic and stellar and planetary organization. What kind of creativity could underlie all those processes? Well, there seem to be two basic answers on the market within the conventional world views. One is the materialist view that says the whole thing is entirely due to blind chance, that there's nothing but a kind of darkness of blind material processes going on, and then by blind chance, new things happen. That's the materialist theory. And it really says, by saying it's blind chance, it basically says, don't think about it. You know, it's chance, there's nothing more that you can say, so just forget it, you know, take it for granted. Because there's no reason or there's nothing intelligible about it. It just happens and there's nothing more you can say. Um, the other theory is derived from the Platonic traditions of the Platonic theology and says that it all happens because, in a sense, it was all made up in the mind of God. Everything that happens, every new form that appears, corresponds to an eternal archetype, a kind of eternal idea in the mind of God. But if evolutionary creativity is creativity that keeps on happening. It goes on as the world goes on. It's going on now. It's not something that happened once in an act of creation uh, at the beginning. Um, if it's, it's going on now, it may be entirely blind, but there may be another model for understanding creativity. The other model for understanding creativity, I think, is provided by our own imaginations. Our imaginations are not full of fixed platonic ideas, which are always the same, like platonic minds. They're ongoing, changing, dynamical processes with a kind of creative richness that always surprises us. So the question is, if nature is alive rather than dead, if the universe, if the earth, have a kind of mind or soul of their own, if living organisms are in some sense uh, mind-like, or if there's a mind-like process at work in nature, then how does this express its creativity? And so the, then the question is, could this creativity in nature be a product of the imagination of Gaia, of the Gaian mind? Could it be a product of the cosmic imagination? Could there be a kind of imagination working in nature, uh, which is similar to our own imaginations? Um, could our own imaginations be just one conscious aspect of an imagination working through the whole natural world, perhaps unconsciously as it works underneath the surface of our dreams, perhaps sometimes consciously? And could this ongoing imagination be the basis of evolutionary creativity in nature, just as it is uh, in the human realm? So those are the questions that I wanted to raise and ask Terence to follow through on because Terence has studied the imagination more than most of us and um, in a sense I regard him as somebody who has a deep understanding of the dynamics of the human imagination and of its wider importance well certainly I think that the relationship between creativity and imagination is the place to focus if you want to understand uh, the emergence of form out of chaos. Of all the arguments that you make in favor of the theory of morphic resonance, I think the most powerful one is this question, uh, if the laws of nature are eternal, where were they before the Big Bang? It seems to me that just defeats the whole notion of eternal laws of nature because you either have to uh, hypothesize a kind of platonic superspace in which for reasons presumably unknowable 
uh, these were the laws that were present, or you have to somehow say that the laws of nature came into being complete and entire at the moment of the Big Bang. And it's very hard to see how laws of nature, such as uh, gene segregation and uh, uh, that sort of thing, could exist in the situation of high temperature physics and non-molecular systems that prevailed at the beginning of the universe. So my thinking about how pattern came to be in, in the universe has sort of taken all the orthodox positions and stood them on their head. And I think that's a useful place to begin. How would it be, or is it credible that perhaps what the universe is, is a kind of system in which more advanced forms of order actually influence previous states of organization. This is what is emerging in Ralph Abraham's work with the uh, chaotic attractors. They are attractors. That means that they exert influence on less organized states and pull them toward some kind of end state. And for me, the key to unlocking what is going on with history, creativity, progressive uh, process of all sorts is to place uh, the state of completion at the end, but to see it as a kind of higher dimensional object which casts an enormous and flickering shadow over the lower dimensions of organization of which this universe is one. So that, for instance, in the human domain, when we look at history, what we see is an endless series of anticipations. The golden age is coming. The Messiah is immediately around the corner. Great change is soon to be upon us. These are intimations of change. It's almost as though the transcendental object that is the great attractor in many, many dimensions uh, throws out images of itself which filter down through these lower dimensional matrices and actually are the basis of the appetition of nature for greater expression of form, the appetition of the human soul for greater immersion in beauty, the appetition of human history for greater expression of complexity. So um, when I think about these terms, chaos, creativity, imagination, I see them, it's like a three-stroke engine of some sort. Each impels and runs the other and sets up uh, a reinforcing cycle that then stabilizes uh, organisms, processes that are caught up in this in the phenomenon of being. The phenomenon of being is this self-synergizing engine of a, out of chaos, through creativity, into the imagination, back into chaos, out into creativity, uh, so forth and so on. And it operates on many levels simultaneously so that the planet is undergoing a destiny. The model, you know, deep time, the time of geology was only really discovered around the turn of this century. And it is cosmically uh, ennobling to, to think of the universe as a thing of great age. But I think that it's time to put in place next to the notion of deep cosmic time, the notion of chaotic, uh, sudden uh, change, cusp flux, and sudden perturbation. Because at the, what deep time has revealed 
as we've pushed our understanding of the career of organic life back 65 million years, 270 million years, what we see is tremendous punctuation built into the universe in the case of the Earth in the form of asteroidal impacts. This thing which happened 65 million years ago, nothing larger than a chicken walked away from it on this planet. So it, there's a strange paradox where <laughs> taking deep time seriously, the message of deep time is you may not have as much time as you thought, that the universe is dynamic, capable of turning sudden corners. So then the imagination becomes a kind of beacon. The imagination is, as it were, a scout sent ahead or a, a, uh, something which has preceded us into history and in fact is a kind of eschatological object. It is shedding uh, influence the morphogenetic field, if you wish. If the morphogenetic field is not subject to the inverse square law of decreased influence over distance, then I, as a layman, don't see why, Rupert, we couldn't uh, locate it at the conclusion of process. Because, you know, one of the things that's always puzzled me about the Big Bang is... Uh, it's a singularity. This is the term physicists use for it. This means theory cannot predict it, and yet it is necessary to make everything which follows from it happen. So you just say, you know, there's no reason for this, we have no argument for this, but the rest of the theory needs it, so it's a singularity. And the immense improbability which modern science rests on but cares not to discuss is this. The belief that the universe sprang from nothing in a single moment. Well, if you can make that leap to believe that, <laughs> it's very hard to see what you couldn't believe. That is almost the limiting case of credulity, I would think. You know? So in order to save the phenomenon, I would propose a different idea that, uh, and it, I think it is eminently reasonable, and it is that as the complexity of a system increases, so too does the likelihood of its generating a singularity or an unpredictable perturbation. So the, the pre-existent state of the universe, I imagine to be extremely simple, an unflawed nothingness. In other words, the least likely situation in which you would expect a singularity to emerge. But now let's look at the other end of the historical continuum of the history of the universe. Uh, let's look at the uh, world we are living in, which is full of uh, 106 elements, tremendous gradients of energy ranging from the, what's going on inside pulsars and quasars to what is going on inside viruses and cells, tremendous organizational capacity at the atomic level, at the molecular level, at the level of molecular polymerization, at the level of membranes and gels, at the level of uh, cells and organelles, organisms, societies, uh, so forth and so on. In other words, the universe at this moment is a tremendously complicated, integrated, multi-leveled, dynamic thing. And every passing moment, it becomes more so. This is what evolution, history, compression of time, what all these things are attempting to indicate is the increasing complexity of reality. Well, then, is it not reasonable to suspect that if a singularity is necessary to explain this universe, that singularity must emerge rather near the end of the complexification process rather than 
its beginning. You see, we simply have to reverse our preconceptions about the flow of cause and effect, and then we get a great attractor that pulls all organization and structure toward itself over several billion years. And as uh, the objects of its attraction uh, grow closer to its proximity, they somehow interpenetrate. Uh, they set up uh, standing wave patterns of interference. New, possible, uh, new properties become emergent and the entire thing complexifies. Well, to my mind, this is um, uh, the divine imagination. This is what Blake called it. This is the only way I can conceive of it that uh, Rupert and I were chatting last night in our room about the aboriginal nature of God, this idea which is built into Whitehead, that somehow time is the theater of God's becoming. But it's also, from the point of view of a higher dimensional manifold, a kind of fit accompli, and this is no contradiction, or if it is, it's all right, because in these realms of higher ontology, you're always asked to avoid closure and hold the notion of a coincidencia positorum, a union of opposites. The thing is both what it is and what it is not, and yet it somehow escapes contradiction, and that's how uh, the open system is maintained. That's how uh, the miracle of uh, life is possible. So I sort of think of the divine imagination as uh, the, the class of all things both possible and beautiful. It's a kind of reverse Platonism. The attractor is at the bottom of a very deep pit into which all phenomena is uh, cascading and being brought into a kind of compressed state. This is happening in the biological realm through the career of the evolution of life, which paleontological uh, data makes clear. But it's also simultaneously happening uh, in the world as we experience it within our culture. In other words, what we call history. History is uh, the the tracks in the snow left by creativities wandering in the divine imagination. And if you are a student of theories of history, you know that these tracks in the snow, what is taught in modern universities these days, is that these tracks in the snow are going nowhere. The technical term is trendlessly fluctuating. And we're told that history is this kind of process. It's trendlessly fluctuating. It goes here, it goes there. It's called a random walk in information theory. It means you just wander around. And Well, it's very interesting. Now we begin to see through the marvel of, uh, of the new mathematics that random walks are not random at all that a sufficiently long random walk becomes a fractal structure of extraordinary depth and beauty. So you see, really what has to happen partially this weekend is for us to see chaos not as something that degrades information and is somehow the enemy of order, but rather chaos is the birthplace of order. Chaos is not the problem. Chaos is uh, the answer. It's the inability to surrender that is the major cultural problem. This is because everybody's personality is structured around the male ego, this tumorous growth that has come upon us since the collapse of the Gylanic worldview that was practiced in the ancient Middle East. This shift of emphasis from collective tribal values to the, the me values 
and uh, away from partnership and toward domination is uh, typical of the resistance of this need to surrender to the imagination. It amazes me. I was somewhere recently and two people who I didn't know were sitting at a table next to me in a restaurant and one of them was explaining to the other one something about the dynamics of the atmosphere and the person to whom it was being explained was very intently trying to understand this complex phenomenon and I thought to myself, amazing, these people go at this as though the weather wouldn't happen unless they understood its functioning and they place great importance upon it. We each place great importance upon our own uh, ability to understand reality as though you were an understudy for God or something, <laughs> so that if anything <laughs> happened and they tapped you, you'd be able to say, that's all right, I can handle it, I understand thermodynamics and all this stuff. No problem. No pro well, this is uh, not exactly uh, this abandonment to the partnership life lived in the creative imagination uh, that I had in mind. Well, we could go on and on about this, but I hope this has stirred up something uh, in you and we can go forward with it. Well, I think the, I'm very interested that you start your description of the imagination from the cosmic attractor, or the, um, which sounds to me like a combination of Plato, Thomas Taylor, and Tyler de Chardin. It's the idea of... Um, the omega point in Tyre de Chardin is the attractor of the whole evolutionary process. It's all being drawn towards this end point, which is actually very like Aristotle's conception of God too. He thought that the prime mover of the heavenly spheres, as the heavens went round, was God. The heavens were not being pushed by God, they were being pulled by God, who was so attractive that the motion of the heavens was kept eternally, especially in the outer spheres, in very fast rotational movement. The fast rotation being the closest they could achieve to the divine state of eternal bliss. And the God was the prime mover by pulling the entire cosmic process, by attracting it. So I think that this idea of attraction, it has ancient roots. It's something that in this century has been brought out by Tyre de Chardin. I think, actually, we have to have some notion of an attractor for the evolutionary process of the cosmos. And this has now actually become part of common discussion through the anthropic cosmological principle, which is the idea of the whole cosmic evolution being, in some sense, designed so that it could give rise to human cosmologists. Um, the, this is the uh, conception, this is the form the argument usually takes within cosmology. The uh, argument is the cosmos must be such as to have allowed the evolution of carbon-based life on at least one planet and then to allow the evolution of human intelligence so that we cosmologists could be around to discuss it. Well, this in a sense is a fairly obvious point to make. You wouldn't think it was very controversial, but it is um, because... Uh, it implies that there's some purposive organization in the cosmos that's given rise to cosmologists um, and other people as a kind of byproduct. Uh, <laughs> well, this is what they're busy talking about in, in modern cosmology, the anthropic cosmological principle. Um, if there is an attractor in the evolutionary process, then I think which I think there must be, I agree with that. Then the question is, how does it work in the process of evolutionary creativity? One way is to make this attractor a kind of platonic mind in the future, which is what Terence, you seem to be doing, um, making it the old platonic mind containing all possible forms and archetypes somewhere out there in the future. And then this somehow interacts with what's going on now. The way I understood it from Terence's description was that there's an ongoing system in the cosmos, in the world, where we are now, uh, an ongoing system of habits built up through the past and what's happened in the past. And habits have a certain density. I mean, matter is, in a sense, dense because it's so deeply habitual. 
There's a sense in which habits are the basis of the kind of density and the sheer materiality of the natural world and its sheer resistance to the imagination. Um, the fact that everything's so deeply embedded in habit. Um, and then, left to themselves, of course, habits would just fossilize and the whole world would just become intensely, repetitively habitual. But they can't be left to themselves because there's other active process going on, which is the cosmological expansion associated with the continued presence of chaos within the universe, which means that habits are permanently, or all the time, or at least intermittently, being disrupted by unexpected accidents like asteroids hitting the Earth. Or, um, uh, as we see in our own lives, our habits are permanently being disrupted by unexpected accidents. This creates new conditions, new possibilities, new vacuums where new things can happen. And somehow, as I understood it, between this the needs, the vacuums, the ongoing um, crises of the present, the problems, the tensions. Um, these then somehow interact with the cosmic attractor, and it's as if sparks pass between them. Uh, what's the situation or the problems now attracting to themselves those aspects of the divine mind which are appropriate to the present circumstances, creating a kind of imaginative penumbra around what's actually happening, a whole realm of the imagination related to what's going on, just as our own imaginations are related to what we're interested in. Our own dreams reflect our own preoccupations and interests and drives and hidden motivations. Um, so the imagination working in that way by a kind of spark between this uh, divine mind or cosmic attractor and the present situation. Well, that's what I understood you to be saying. And... Um, I think that's all right, except that I myself find it more interesting to, instead of, say, everything that can possibly happen is already there, which is, in a sense, a way of denying creativity. It says that creativity is simply the manifest of a future potentiality or possibility, which is also, at the same time, eternal, because the future of the cosmos must at least have endured as long as the cosmos. And, in a sense, the final unified attractor is in a sense a reflection of the primal unified state of the Big Bang. The two have a symmetrical relationship to them. They're part of a familiar model of history in which the end, in some sense, reflects the beginning, or at which, in which the end, in some sense, is the beginning at a higher turn of the spiral, whichever model one prefers. But I'm interested in the possibility that the imagination isn't all there, all worked out in potential in advance, but rather that the world truly is made up as it goes along. And this is something that um, I think in Bergson's book, Creative Imagination, he very strongly emphasizes that evolution implies ongoing creativity. And we'll do anything we can to avoid this notion because it's so extremely difficult to conceive of ongoing creativity you either have this tendency to reject the question and say, well, it's ongoing creativity, but it's entirely random, so you can't think about it, or substitute some kind of platonic realm for creativity where it's all there already in some sense. So what I'm trying to look at is a third possibility where the imagination really is made up as it goes along. And instead of emerging, as it were, from the light in the future or from a kind of platonic mind, it may emerge from something much more like the unconscious mind. It may come into light from darkness and the formative processes of the imagination may not be sparks leaping from the mind of God, but rather new forms welling up from the womb of chaos. Well, it's very interesting to hear you say this because I, I shouldn't have predicted it. Um, let me see if I can explain why. Um, it seems to me the problem revolves around this notion of purpose. Is there one? Is there not one? If there is one, what is it? Well, the 19th century science was at tremendous pains to eliminate purpose from all of its model building in order to make once and for all a clean break 
with the contaminating power of deism, essentially. So that, for instance, in evolutionary theory as it was evolved in the 19th century, the, the stress, the, the great breakthrough for them, you see, was that they had a random process they didn't know that it was mutation through radiation, but they called it sporting or the production of variant types, a random process, and then a second random process, which was selection for fitness to the environment. And you run these two random processes head into each other, and out of it emerges exquisite order animals, plants, ecosystems. So they said, you see, we have no need for God or purposes or divine plans. We show that out of the chaos of the moment emerges order. And this tendency was so strong in 19th century and early 20th century biology that, uh, for instance, they sought to entirely appropriate uh, the word evolution and it was not to be used in any other context. I had a biologist once say to me, if it doesn't involve genes, it isn't evolution. So you cannot talk about the evolution of the novel, the sonata, uh, socialism. It, it has to involve genes. Well, it, largely through the work of Eric Jansch, who we mentioned last night, this was overthrown. Uh, I, I don't believe that everything is finished somehow in some deterministic sense at the end of the cosmos, but I do believe that, uh, there, is, that there is some kind of intimation of purpose that keeps peregrinations of processes through time from simply becoming random walks. If you, if you believe that all of the imagination is being made up in the present, then you're, you're back with the trendlessly fluctuating theorists of history. Because if none of it exists in the future, then there is no compass point upon which to fix, to guide the process forward. Now, I know you're familiar with C.H. Waddington's idea of creodes. Mm. And for me, that's been the way to preserve your intuition of that it's all being made all at once. And the, my strong intuition and I think the logical necessity for this compass point in the future. And the way you do it is you say that the universe is not determined in what will happen, what will undergo what Whitehead calls the formality of occurring, but rather the universe is determined in, in the way I mentioned last night. It, time is a topological manifold over which events must flow subject to the constraints of the manifold. And I call the surface of the manifold novelty and believe that we can uh, say where in history great outbreaks of novelty occurred and so forth. But that is not what's important for this argument. What's important for this argument is that without knowing any of its content, we can place the novelty of novelties, the novelty to the nth power of novelty, we can place it at the end of the historical process and then watch it as operate as an attractor without having any information about it at all that is really uh, of its essence, which I think comes very close still though all this modern jargon has been hung on to it, to uh, uh, Neoplatonism. We have to maintain the unknowability of God, hence the, unknow the ultimate unknowability of the imagination. But nevertheless, we have to grant it as, a, as an attractor, nevertheless. That would be my take on that. Well... I mean, it's partly a question of, as I see it, of what, what role one thinks the attractor has. I think that the cosmic attractor, as Tyler de Chardin conceives it, as 
or as Aristotle conceives it, is drawing things towards a state of higher unity. That's how you could express it. Mm -hmm. So one could say there's a process that attracts the entire evolutionary process of drawing things towards states of higher unity. And not just states but in general, but as many possible states as can be. Otherwise, why would there be so many forms of life, so, ma so much variety in nature? Um, but it may be, you see, the question is, are the new forms arising in the attractor? Or is the attractor simply attracting what's already a diversity of forms um, through a process that lies be between them, as it were, the imagination? I think that creativity seems to involve, like a, the Jungians talk about the welling up of forms from the unconscious. And it's as if there's a kind of creative process like welling up or boiling up of new forms, an incredible diversity. Um, and they're forms which are conditioned by memories of what have gone before and existing habits. Uh, but they're forms which make new syntheses, new patterns. And it could be that if there's a kind of unifying process working upon uh, a boiling up of new forms, that anything that comes out, as it were, above the surface of the unconscious or the darkness or the boiling process or the chaos um, to, has to take on a kind of unified form, as it were, to come above that surface. That The light, as it, as it were, into which it comes um, is a unifying principle. So it has to take on a unified form, but it could be any unified form. And um, as long as it's a kind of unified form, because it's a unifying principle into which the creativity is occurring or tending. Um, so in, I think in our own case, the one model for this is, is dreams, that dreams involve the appearance of these strange stories and narratives and symbols and images which... Um, we don't create with our conscious minds. In fact, we usually just forget the whole lot, this wonderful display of psychic creativity that happens to each of us nightly is usually just forgotten or disregarded. But when we remember our dreams, um, they're bizarre and unexpected. It seems almost impossible to have an expected dream. And most of them have an, a continuous element of surprise somewhere hovering around them. And this curious feature of dreams and it raises the question of where they um, how they come from the Jungians would say that they come from some structuring process in the darkness of the collective unconscious and they'd see that as separate, a kind of imagination of matter or imagination of the psyche not uh, a kind of descent from some higher world but a welling up from a um, and, and so what I'm interested in is that the human imagination obviously works through dreams. It works during discussions, through language, through conversations, it, through fantasies, through novels, through our dreams, our aspirations, you know, through advertising. Uh, and it also is revealed through psychedelics in a particularly extreme form. Now, in what sense is this imagination that we actually know about, that we know about from experience, related to the imaginative creative principle of nature? Is Gaia, as it were, awake on the side that's in the sunlight and in the side that's in the darkness as it rotates, dreaming? At night, are the plants, the animals, the, the whole ecosystems, the oceans, in some sense, in a dream state when dreams and spontaneous images of what might be possible uh, come to them? So, is there a kind of Gaian dreaming, and does it happen on the night side of the planet? Um, is, so, is the imagination, as it were, located? How is it rooted in... Um, cosmic events. I mean, what would the Gaian mind feel like? What, what form would a Gaian dream take? Or what form would a Gaian psychedelic experience take? That's how I'd like to know how you're thinking of it. I think a Gaian dream would be human history. That uh, human history, perhaps it isn't that the planet sleeps each night, but that perhaps it's been sleeping for 50,000 years and is having a dyspeptic dream that causes it to toss and turn 
But if it could only awaken from that dream, it would just shake its head and say, my God, I don't know what it was, but I hope it doesn't come back. <laughs> that human history has that quality. I mean, James Joyce should be mentioned here, saying history is the nightmare from which I'm trying to awaken. And the whole structure of his novels, the integrating of historical data with daily newspapers and this sort of thing to give reality the quality of a dream. I think your mentioning of the psychedelics is important. You said it was an extreme and intense example of this. I think that it's so intense and extreme an example that it argues strongly that the divine, Im that the imagination is not the human imagination. While we may be able to analyze dreams and see the acting out of wish fulfillment or repressed sexual drives or whatever, depending on our theory of dreams, the psychedelic experience, it's preposterous to attempt to analyze it in terms of human motivation at its intense levels. It seems rather to be an ontological reality of its own that the human being has simply privil been privileged to briefly observe, but it says no more, your psychedelic, ex your deep psychedelic experiences say no more about your personality than that the continent of Africa is making a statement about your personality. They are in fact independent uh, objects. Uh, to my mind, the divine imagination or the imagination is this, the source of all creativity in our dreams, in our psychedelic experiences, in the jungles, in the currents of the ocean, in the organization of protozoan and microbial life. Wherever there is large-scale integration, rather than simply raw physics, but integration of laws of physics, integration of properties of membranes and electrophoresis and this sort of thing. This is, it is the creative principle. Be held. Yes. Be held. So do you think then that in psychedelic experiences you're actually tapping into, tuning into, or experiencing something of the Gaian or the cosmic imagination? Absolutely. And I think that, it, that psychedelic experiences and dreams are only different in degree, that they are chemical cousins somehow. And this is why I could see human history as a guy in dream, because I think every night when you descend into dream, you are potentially open to receiving guy in corrective tuning of your life state. You uh, the the whole thing is an enzyme-driven process. We are like an organ of Gaia. We are the uh, organ which binds and releases energy. For re I mean, a liver cell doesn't need to understand why it binds and releases enzymes of the liver. We bind and release energy for reasons perhaps never to be clear to us, but which place us firmly within the context of... Uh, of the guy in mind. We have been chosen out. And this is not something to have great hubris about. I mean, indolacetic acid has been chosen out in plant metabolism to play certain roles. We have a role, but our role seems to be a major one. We are like a triggering system out of the general background of evolutionary processes mediated by incoming radiation to the surface of the earth and then natural selection, suddenly we come with an epigenetic capability. We write books, tell stories, dance, sing, carve, paint. These are not genetic processes. These are epigenetic processes. And they bind information and express the guy in mind uh, very well. As an example of how willing I am to introduce or to entertain this idea concretely, I've been talking to a lot of people about ecological crisis and the fate of the world and this sort of thing. Well, imagine 
in hindsight, the wisdom that we would impute to Gaia if we were to suddenly realize that what is happening on this planet is that nature knows that the sun is going to explode. And what we are is a kind of response to the anticipation of a wounding that 50,000, 5 million years ago, the geo-heliocentric relationships began to vibrate out of tune. And um, as a consequence of this, a species was called forth that could organize an escape. And we are it. In other words, we are in a divine play. In line with this, and what made me even entertain these ideas is I had a very bizarre experience recently. I was in Hawaii and uh, in our botanical garden there is a very large dead tree and one limb of this tree sticks far out over the over the land and uh, Banisteriopsis capi, a large hallucinogenic South American vine, is planted at the at the bottom of this tree, and uh, it just has swarmed up this tree and covered it with greenery, but it wouldn't go out onto this one limb that stuck out, and I it bothered my sense of symmetry that this vine would not completely cover this tree. And I even thought about trying to climb up into the tree and thread it out onto this limb to get it to do what I wanted. So I was sitting looking at this tree and this situation and actually thinking about it. And suddenly the limb fell. (laughs) It broke off. And then I thought, and I thought, the vine sensed that it was in unstable. It would not invade this domain that it sensed was structurally unstable. Well, then I said to myself, but how could it? What is the mechanism of this sensing of instability? And a, a friend of mine said, well, perhaps the wind impacts on weakened wood differently than on unrotted wood and perhaps rhythms in the tree tell it to stay away from them. And then I realized if one plant has that kind of sensitivity to the entering into a domain of danger, what must the ecosystem of this planet be doing in reaction to what we are doing to the planet. So it, I, I see, uh, the reason this relates to the imagination is because I see uh, ourselves in communication with the imagination. It is sending images back into the past to try and direct us away from areas of instability. It really is the Gaian mind is a real mind Its messages are real messages, and our task through discipline, psychedelics, attention to detail, whatever we have going, is to try and extract this message and eliminate ourselves from the message so that we then can see the face of the other and respond to what what it wants. So it isn't for me a philosophical problem. It's a problem that relates to the politics and action that we take as a collectivity and as uh, individuals. Just one more reflection on that. Um, You see, if we tune in through our own imaginations to the Gaian mind, which certainly seems to me an attractive idea, and I think fits quite well, perhaps, with uh, dreams, psychedelic experience, imagination, and so on, The question for me is this. We can relate to the Gaian imagination. Let's take that for granted. But then, how is the Gaian imagination related to the imagination of the solar system? And that of the solar system related to the imagination of the galaxy? The imagination of the galaxy to the imagination of the cosmos? And then, how is that related to what we could call the imagination of the cosmic attractor, or God the Father, or 
Um, well, I, I'm Christ. not sure that I want to follow you into the cosmic Christ. <laughs> uh, for me, the mind of the solar system, I, I'm, I think there should always be some physical stuff to hang these things on. The Gaian mind is not a problem. The earth teems with life. Uh, a Jovian mind is not a problem because the complex chemistry, the uh, metallic behavior of gas ices under pressure and all of this stuff seems to me to place enough cards on the table that mind could well emerge in that situation. Similarly, the oceans of Europa, uh, there are a number of places in the solar system where there's enough complex chemistry that I can imagine these very large self-reflecting entelechies to get going over billions of years. But to move from that to the hypothesis of a, hierarch a continuous hierarchy of minds out to the level of the galactic mind, um, you have to ask hard questions. I mean, how, does, how long does it take the galactic mind to think a thought? Does it do it uh, instantaneously via morphogenetic fields? And if so, then what are the transducing and signal uh, sorting filters through which it goes? If it does it through light, then to say that its thoughts are vaster than empires and more slow is to suggest that they're very high-speed phenomena indeed. Empires come and go by the thousands before a galactic thought could reach from one side of itself to the other. <laughs> but I think that just to... If we're thinking of galactic imaginations in the basis form, one would be the all the probabilistic processes and the stars and everything within it, if the communication is instantaneous, which it may be, um, or if it isn't, we, we don't really know because I think a, a, a factor which changes everything is the discovery of dark matter, the fact that 90 to 95, 99% of the matter in the universe is utterly unknown to us. Uh, this recent discovery effectively tells us that the whole cosmos and every material thing in it has a kind of unconscious, a material unconscious, an unknown dark realm which conditions everything that happens, the shapes of the galaxies, their interactions, um, and what's going on. But it's utterly unknown to us. And so we've now got a kind of cosmic material unconscious which could play the same role as our own unconscious is. And so your search for the basis of the imagination in the known phenomena of physics and the visible realm uh, is certainly an important one. But the fact is that there's so much more that physics itself has revealed which is there and could be the basis of any number of processes. Yes, I assume that... Um psychedelics, for instance, somehow change your channel from the evolutionarily important channel, which is giving traffic reports, weather reports, and stock market reports, <laughs> to a channel which is playing, you know, the classical music of an alien civilization. In other words, we tend to tune to the channel which has big payback in the immediate world but that there are these other channels of, of uh, the imagination not so tailored for human consumption uh, seems obvious to me. I think that you're right. I mean, the memories and hence all uh, objects of cognition are not in wetware, the wetware of brains. It's somehow plucked out of a, a super space of some sort via very subtle quantum mechanical transductions that go on at the molecular level in the brain. The divine imagination is the reality behind appearances. Mm -hmm. Appearances is simply the local slice of the divine imagination. But what you want is a kind of map or a global overview. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps we should open this up if people have something they would like to say. This mm -hmm. man leads okay. the way. Well, of course, you've fired every neuron in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> I have a somewhat different view of the problem of the eternal scientific laws. Uh, in my opinion, the question of did these laws exist prior to the Big Bang is a non-question. 
It's like the old Zen question of what happens to your fist when you open your hand. Because in my view, uh, these scientific laws are not objects in space and time. If they were objects in space and time, of course they could not exist before the Big Bang. In my view, these scientific laws are linguistic structures uh, that, we, that we create, that we choose, in order to give reasonably good expression to the regularities that we measure in the world uh, and which we use uh, for prediction and control purposes. Uh, for example, we have an equation to express uh, uh, the gravity relationship, uh, and we have placed in that equation to uh, 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 key in uh, the acceleration of the force of gravity. Uh, it's not 32 feet per second per second. It differs somewhat from that, and it differs depending on where you measured on the Earth. And it's even conceivable to imagine that it might change uh, with space and with, with time. Uh, because it's been going on for so many billions of years now, uh, uh, in Rupert's view, I'm sure that it would be unlikely to change very much, but it's perfectly possible for it to change. And the point I want to make is that science provides in that equation uh, an opportunity to clue in this different change if that change is necessary for purposes of prediction and control. Uh, I think that the laws of nature uh, can be used for purposes of prediction and control within the kind of, of, of developing evolutionary uh, uh, cosmology that Rupert has expressed it. All right, well then, hey. well, the, 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 yes. I mean, the thing is that there are two theological views, you see, that are possible about this. If, if the laws of nature are linguistic structures outside space and time, the, at least in the Judeo-Christian world, the prevailing archetype is the word of God. They're the word of God. They're the logos, uh, which is the traditional theological view of the laws of nature. So then it really comes down to a theological question. Do we think that the the word of God is a kind of eternally sonorous set of vibrations or linguistic structures that somehow permanently there in the permanent mind of a transcendent God? Or is the word of God something that God speaks and like real words uh, is a series of processes in time? Spoken words are not eternally there. They're things that take time to speak. And the underlying basis of a spoken word is the flow of the spirit or the breath. So, are the words of God, if we take this Logos model, spoken words that take, uh, involve a process in time, or are they like a sort of encyclopedia that's written words that can be sort of eternal? No. Uh, in, in my view, uh, they're not... Uh, I, I don't see... A, the theological argument is a non-argument to me, because I, I reject the idea of the mind of God as having a structure in the universe or... A, uh, again, I come back to these uh, uh, scientific laws of nature as human formulations uh, created like tools, created like a set of wrenches in our kit bag, uh, not a part of any eternal structure whatsoever. But at the same time, I recognize that certain of these laws that we have created uh, are of such a nature that it would be very hard to conceive of us having a science without them. Well, I think that there are a couple of issues here. First of all, what has always given science its tremendous cachet was its ability to produce in the realm of uh, application and technology. So I agree with you that these things are like wrenches. But that, that is not at all satisfying to a philosopher of science who, want, who doesn't care about the application but wants to know, uh, you know, is this or is this not in fact so. Uh, Rupert is uh, suggesting that ha laws are habits and that habits change over time. They are incremental. Therefore, in his view, no law is in fact a law. It's a tendency or a creeping gradient of some sort. Uh, now, the argument for this 
is that we've only been measuring the constants we use to describe the universe. We've only been measuring them for a hundred years on one planet. We say that the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second and we've measured it on one planet for a hundred years and we extrapolate this statement to the entire cosmos. If, in fact, uh, uh, laws are local and invariant, then this is going to be a hard swallow because it, it makes science no more than a series of localized opinions. It turns science into folklore. The thing that personally I find a, a personal discovery of, and I don't think it comes from reading outside, is just a realm of pure geometric possibility, of pure form and symmetry. And this seems to me the underlying Pythagorean or Platonic concept, and that it does exist outside of time, and that it's some sort of template off of which possibility hangs and that what undergoes the formality of actually occurring resonates against this template and also most likely resonates against what has been materially manifested so that it's going to time. Yes, well, I agree with what you're saying about a template. I mean, this is this idea of a topology that I want to put out. Rupert and I were again last night after the meeting talking about the idea of God as a mathematical mind had come up and I was saying how much a mathematically minded God would miss how impoverished that concept is because the primary qualities of experience which are color, light, tactility, and then even subtler things like, uh, uh, you know, appetition for the past and the future. So all of this would be eliminated from the idea of the mathematical God. In a way, uh, I, uh, the way I see it is it's almost as though there is a, a um, wire frame. Yes, that the future is almost a kind of mathematical wire frame and that that's what God quote unquote knows in eternity but the whole the whole point of the game is into this wire frame flows uh, the the living richness uh, the perverse uh, creativity the unpredictability the uh, perturbations the interference patterns that create them the living fact of the felt presence and then that uh, wave of complexification dies down and leaves in its wake the fossil imprint of its passage, which is memory. So you have, you know, the wire frame, then the moment of interface of the wire frame with the memory, which is what we call the present, which is absolutely what's happening, the richest part of it, and then uh, the wake the, the, the shock wave of the eschatological moment of the now, which is just the historical record of its having occurred. I always think in terms of politics, so I want to weld us into not three disparate points of view, but a movement with a forward thrust. So I've suggested that what you're witnessing is the birth of... Uh, uh, geometric compressionism or morphogenetic compressionism or psychedelic compressionism depending on which one of us is talking I'm sure you can figure out who is who but the idea is drawing together that a new phenomenon has been discovered in the universe which is its drawing togetherness its tendency toward cohesion its tendency to move toward greater and greater states of wholeness and not incrementally but in sudden highly punctuated stages that allow phenomena like history or the 20th century uh, to come into being. These are uh, great leaps forward toward this cohesion that nature pushes toward and as I said I don't think that it's uh, millions of years 
in the future. I think this millions of years in the future stuff was a very brief phase in scientific discourse and that as organisms what we need to come to terms with is the the chaos, the turbulence, the turmoil, the ephemerality and the the high stakes nature of the game. You know, even if no asteroid strikes the earth, each one of us in this room will die. And so life is guaranteed to be interesting, uh, even if you don't live in one of these epochs when there is uh, asteroidal impact or geomagnetic reversal. Nevertheless, uh, the ultimate challenge is built into the biological script. We, we each have our own apocalypse, and so I think we should live life in anticipation of it. This uh, gradient mind that you referred to. Gaian mind. Oh, Gaian mind. Gaian mind. Gaian mind. What, what is that? Well, it's the notion um, that for me, and I'm sure Rupert has a different notion, but for me it's the notion that the Linnaean species are an illusion of the classificatory impulse of the human mind and that really what we have on this planet are not distinct species but levels and levels of gene swarming and control and that uh, intelligence, creativity is such a positive adaptation for any biological system that possesses it that I think the planet wouldn't have waited five billion years to allow self-reflecting intelligence in an organism uh, such as ourselves. I think probably self-reflection arose in fairly early in the history of the Earth and that the Earth is a minded, integrated kind of entity. How this works is hard for us to model because we've only had the image to guide us for (coughs) 10 years or so. But uh, uh, the planet thinks, it perceives, life has appetition for more life and for an extension of itself. And the best strategies are cognitive so that all of these things that we see happening on the planet that we take to be miraculously ordered results of random processes may actually be the result of the creation of a great uh, engine of cognition that uh, history is the thought of Gaia, biology is the musings of of geology, and so forth and so on, that we have been wrong to claim consciousness as the unique capacity of human beings. It is, in fact, a general property of organization. And the larger the organization, uh, the more conscious it may well be. So that the, the I don't feel man, uh, human beings are set against nature. I think we occupy a special role in nature, but it's a sanctioned role. There is no such thing as getting out of control because the control system is so deep and so vast that it's inconceivable. But what, hap- what is happening may appear to be out of control because we are not in full connection with what the purpose of all this is. Yeah, really. Yes, let me try and put it a different way, answering the same question about the Gaian mind, because it's obviously one of the things we're interested in talking about here. Um, starting from, just from another, a straightforward starting point, the idea of Gaia put forward by Lovelock and other scientists is that the earth using the name Mother Earth um, Gaia is the Mother Earth of the Greeks that the whole earth is a living organism and that if the whole earth is a living organism and I think in that organism we have to include the moon as well because the moon orbits the earth and in some sense sets its rhythms of time and tide and uh, is part of the Gaian system that the earth is a living organism including the moon, the atmosphere all the living things on it, the oceans and so on, behaves together in a way that uh, 
has an organic, integrated, holistic quality, that the earth is alive, and its life um, involves some kind of organizing principle. At that stage, a lot of people then say, well, if the earth is alive, then in some sense it must be conscious, or in some sense the earth must have a mind. And one of the questions I think we're exploring is just in what sense can we think of the earth as conscious or having a mind? Uh, what might the Gaian mind consist of? The traditional view of the earth is that it's an inanimate assembly of a bit of rock hurtling around the sun with a thin film of uh, moisture and life on its surface. Uh, but the whole thing's just an in inanimate mechanism with no life, no purpose, no spontaneity, no creativity of its own. Merely the, the environment in which other random purposeless processes take place. That's the standard view. But if the earth does have a mind of her own, or a life of her own, a spontaneity of her own, is it entirely unconscious, like our own unconscious minds? Does it come to consciousness? Does Gaia have dreams? Does Gaia have imaginings? Um, this is, um, I think, the questions that underlie Terence's use of the phrase, the Gaian mind. Um, and I think it's a question that's bound to arise. Millions of people are now talking about Gaia, planet Earth, as a living whole. And the question really, one, one of the questions we're exploring is what kind of mind would this living hold ha have? Does this living hole have a mind at all? Is it just blind instinctive? Do, if it has a mind, does it have an imagination? And if so, what kind of imagination does it have? How much is that imagination colored by mathematical principles or geometrical forms which may permeate the whole universe? Uh, how much of it spontaneously arises on Earth in the evolutionary process? How much is it related to the cosmic imagination throughout the whole cosmos? So I think these are the questions it raises, and I think that that's another way of coming to it, just starting with the idea of the Earth as a living organism. It implies and raises the question of the mind of the Earth, if it has one, or the soul of the Earth. Um, some would say that the mind's just another aspect subjectively experienced of the physical changes in the brain. Others would say it's a kind of shadow or epiphenomenon of the functioning of the brain. Um, if we take that view of the mind, we would expect to the Gaian mind, if it exists, to correspond to some set of complex physical processes going on on Earth. Well, I think if we wanted to see it that way, we could make a good case for there being a base to the mind. I'd put the magma of the Earth's core, these flowing currents, as some perhaps like the limbus or the hypothalamus, the sort of long-term driving things with a solid nucleus inside, uh, associated with changing magnetic fields and polar reversals every few million years, and the whole of this being the un underground process virtually unknown to us uh, which is driving the process of continental drift, earthquakes, volcanoes and is actually shaping the morphogenesis of the surface of the earth through the distribution of the continents and then there's the Gaian breath um, which is the atmospheric flows of, of the wind then there's the Gaian circulation of the oceans um, there are many of these systems, all of which are indeterminate, all of which are probabilistic, and all of which could respond to, as it were, kinds of thoughts or impulses of Gaia. So one can find a, a many ways of thinking about the physical basis for the Gaian mind, which would also include, in my opinion, the Earth's magnetic field, the magnetosphere, which trails like a great tail on the dark side of the Earth, which is, surrounds the Earth, and uh, which, as it changes and responds and resonates to sunspots, affects the whole patterns of electromagnetic communication through radio waves. All of this, the field of the Earth, which would, I think, be one of the bases for the Gaian mind. The, even the known fields, the gravitational and the electromagnetic fields, stretch far beyond the surface of the Earth. So all these would be possible bases for the uh, Gaian mind or bases of its interaction with what's going on, as well as the actual minds of organisms, uh, animals and plants. I mean, the Gaian mind may be able to act directly on these minds through field-like processes. I myself would think of the Gaian mind and our own minds as more like field-like processes which interact with our brains. And the Gaian mind is interacting with living processes, the atmosphere, the Earth's core, the magma flows, the magnetic field, um, interacting with them but not being reducible to them. I guess my question is really about um, the, the relationship to creation and uh, creativity and imagination. Is there a qualitative 
aspect to, to that that is evolutionary. The suggestion I like to bring up is that there could be a kind of evolutionary field creo, meaning that there is a pathway that when conscious beings are on a planet, the evolutionary field creo would be looking for a kind of an aesthetic, a kind of sensibility. And uh, I would propose a symbiotic relationship as an example of this. Well, creodes are pathways of change which have endpoints. And um, for those who've not been following the literature on creodes, there's, um, the idea is this when an embryo develops, for example, a liver, a group of cells develop into your liver, another group of cells develop into your kidneys, that the pathways of change they go through um, are attracted towards an endpoint, which is the mature kidney or the mature liver, that they're drawn towards that. Um, and this pathway of change drawn towards an endpoint is called a creode. It's uh, considered to be an object within a morphic or a morphogenetic field. Now, if there's a, the idea of the cosmic attractor uh, and the idea of an evolutionary creode, as I understand what you're saying, is that one could say the entire evolutionary process of the Earth or even of the whole cosmos is a kind of creode and Terence's description of the cosmic attractor would be the end point of the evolutionary creode. So in a sense, using the term creode brings us back to that model we were talking about just now. I was kind of missing listening to this discussion what the meaning of the creation and the imagination would be for. What is the purpose of the purpose of this object? What is the uh, fulfillment of this? Can I hmm. make a shot? Yes. This? Well, I'm not sure I understand all of what you're saying, but in terms of this qualitative thing, which is deepening, which is the purposefulness of it all, it's interesting when you look at the whole life of the universe and the way processes have evolved, uh, there is a tendency that has been going on for a very long time that has been accelerated at each step. And what I call it is language seems to be seeking to decouple itself from matter. Uh, DNA was the first language, and it's a language written at the molecular level, and it's faithfully a physical replicant is made of it, and then that template is used to create proteins, which are the statements in this language. Well, that's how all nature does it, except human beings. And we have this epigenetic capability. We can write books, dance, sculpt, paint, all the things that I mentioned. Well, then, when you look at the 20th century, the tendency to dance, paint, sculpt, and so forth has, through technology, become ever more uh, released from the constraints of matter so that now we paint on computer screens uh, we merge, uh, we sculpt with computers, we sculpt with light and directions rather than in matter. So I think that uh, lang why this is, who can say, but the only thing as complex as organic life is syntax. And syntax seems to have a life of its own. It is trying to shed the material matrix, which was its basis. Now this, I'm sure we don't have time to discuss it now, but perhaps later, this creates strong reactions in people because we have a tendency to want things to be folded back into nature. We don't want this Gnostic ascent to the radiant unspeakable. But nevertheless, it appears that language in a kind of hellish marriage with technology has given us no way out except a, for, a forward escape into the further embodiment of language. This now is apparently the only way we can keep from destroying the planet is by literally going off into the imagination, which is not a dimension of, of the physics of space and time. It's actually a syntactical dimension. So the integration of media and human beings and creative processes like CAD CAM and this sort of thing seem to me to say language is shedding 
the primate body that gave it epigenetic articulation in much the same way that language shed the rest of organic nature when in one part of itself it moved off into the, the potential for linguistic expression that our biological organization uh, makes possible. So for my money, uh, language is on a journey to the eternal imagination through the process of creativity, having begun in chaos and having a kind of inevitable end in chaos more properly you know, revisioned, remet, reunderstood. Well, perhaps we should break for lunch. It's after lunch. Um, thank you very much. This was uh, very useful, I think. I hope you enjoyed it. Hello, boys and girls. Welcome to my neighborhood. Can you say neighborhood? Let's do a special experiment right now, okay? Let's put Mr. Hamster in the microwave. Pop goes the wheeze. You know why I did that, boys and girls? Because we're all going to die of severe radiation. I, I, I have to tell you... Stop! Hold that! What the hell are you doing? I, I, I have... Talking to children out here, their fucking brains aren't developed! I, I, I have to do it, Bobby, because they've got to know that the world's going to deteriorate and die. Bullshit! You're supposed to be singing the Silly Squirrel song right now! Nuts don't mean anything to me, Tommy. Fuck you, I've got to tell them. <laughs> Have you had your medication yet? No. Can I please have another one now? Here. Here. Hell, we have three. Thank you, Tommy. Go ahead. <laughs> Hello, boys and girls. <laughs> Let's sing the squirrel song, okay? <laughs> it's not a bad thing. Oh, no, I've lost you. I've gone too far, too early, too quick. <laughs> I'm in the land where nothing's funny now. 